as, as Jim said, I'm working at the University of Surrey, but this is a personal view of work that I've done over the past few years, uh, both with SSTL and with other organizations. I do not speak for those organizations. I'm going to be talking about uh, the interplanetary internet. Uh, quick show of hands, who's heard of the interplanetary internet? Okay, fewer than I was expecting. Um, and some of the work I've been doing to put the internet in space, how it all started with the USAT 12 or um, OSCAR 36, as you guys know it, and uh, how we were able to do a number of uh, internet in space tests with the UK Disaster Monitoring Constellation satellite, and then move on from that to actually be the first to test the interplanetary internet in space. So, the interplanetary internet. This was an effort that was announced uh, 13 years ago now, would you believe, by Vince Cerf, who's pictured at the top right there. Vince, a very famous computer scientist, uh, responsible for the development of TCP IP and uh, the development of the early internet. It was, the internet was famously an experiment that got out of control. He's currently, um, if you like, taking the rap for the internet running out of address spaces, saying that when he designed it in the 1970s, 32-bit address space seemed like a very good idea, and it's not his fault that the experiment was so successful. Now, Vint has been working with Adrian Hook at the bottom right. Adrian has, uh, is an English-American uh, NASA veteran of 30 years, did some early work on Apollo, and has set up uh, the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, CCSDS, um, in 1982. CCSDS is an ISO standard <coughs> subgroup that sets communication standards for the space environment. Uh, and Adrian and CCSDS's problem is that spacecraft design predates modern computer networking. Um, so there's kind of a tape recorder bitstream mindset where you just stream off the bits. Uh, you're not in a kind of packetized kind of format. And uh, as a result, very difficult to handle it, very difficult to move data around the internet as a result. And he was interested in moving them towards packets and networking. Given that deep space has very long delays, uh, long propagation delays, a lot of terrestrial pro protocols, uh, quite famously TCP itself, don't work because they have timers which time out and are just impatient. They say, OK, I'm giving up now. This is obviously not going to work. I'm not going to wait the extra 20 minutes it's going to take to communicate with Mars. And the thing to bear in mind is, is that so these guys, similar age, um, got together talking. And really, this is, if you like, it's a, it's a public conversation that NASA is having with itself about how NASA does stuff. Uh, in the US, uh, the Air Force gets funded for a lot of space activity, and that's done pretty much on the quiet. NASA has to fight for funding every step of the way. There are large numbers of NASA centers across the US as a result of how NASA was set up way back when. And NASA is the show. NASA is PR. Everything that NASA does it's pretty much up, to, up for public debate, like should the James Webb telescope be cancelled or not. And really, what Vint is taking part of here is a conversation inside NASA as to how NASA does networking. So NASA convinces other parts of NASA by doing publicity. So as a result, a lot of this is very much public. Now, inside NASA, a lot of the development of space protocols has been done by this guy here, Scott Burley, uh, works with Adrian. He's pictured from an IEEE Spectrum magazine in August 2005. You know, his concerns are the CCSDS space and migrating them. Uh, over the years, he's developed the CCSDS file delivery protocol. Uh, and now he's developed the bundle protocol for delay tolerant networking um, for the interplanetary internet and the LICLIDER transmission protocol, which transports it. Uh, adoption of these things is fairly slow because operational uh, NASA uh, people who are actually you know, doing the project management are reluctant to assume any risk and actually adopt new protocols. Uh, CFDP Lite is in use by the Messenger Mercury probe and by the Deep Impact Comet mission, which I'll be talking about a bit more later. And there's a heritage there. You can see the resemblance between uh, LTP with the bundle protocol running over it and Scott's earlier CFDP design. So this is the uh, NASA JPL approach to deep space communications. Um, taking CCSDS protocols, trying to evolve them, always being aware of the legacy base, and trying to bring uh, the project managers on side and convince them that they can afford to take safe steps going forwards. But NASA is uh, a large organization with a large number of centers. and As a result, there is a room for differences of opinion. 
Now here we have Scott holding Mars, always concerned with the deep space problem. And in fact, NASA is very proud of the fact that they have interoperability between the orbiters and the landers and rovers at Mars. Uh, and also interoperability between NASA and ESA there. Yeah. That is true deep space networking. Now, also inside NASA, we have here Keith Hoagie. Now, Keith is holding the Earth and Moon. So, um, Keith actually has more balls than Scott, um, which is, is literally and figuratively true because Keith has a different engineering approach where he's done the CCSDS development a number of times. And the nature of the CCSDS communications is that every layer is optimized to get the most out of those difficult deep space links. Uh, in networking, we talk a lot about uh, layering and modularity. And Keith said, well, if I reinvent, uh, say, new coding, introduce turbo codes or LDPC codes at the lower physical layer in the CCSDS stack, then the framing changes, and I have to re-implement the framing and redo everything all the way up the stack. And you know, he said, well, there's got to be a better way of doing it. And his approach is basically to use uh, commercial uh, standards, um, particularly HDLC communications, which you all know as, as X25 runs over it, use the internet protocol over standard frame relay, frame relay over ISO standard HDLC. And he's demonstrated that this worked, first with uh, Surrey, particularly on USAT-12, and also on the final Columbia mission, uh, the CANDOS uh, communication and navigation demonstration on board the shuttle mission that was in the payload bay. Uh, so his approach is saying we can reuse commercial stuff quite nicely. And his approach has been popular in um, low orbit, but has not yet really gone that far into deep space. He's also got this neat judo move where he points out that because CCSDS is a tape recorder bit stream from way back when, layering HDLC over it and treating CCSDS as just a physical layer is actually possible to do. Uh, the CCSDS community uh, is not kind of keen on that particular approach because then it says just CCSDS is just a link layer. And they point out correctly that for deep space, you do actually want to optimize absolutely everything and you are willing to spend the engineering resources and redo the things to get that extra 0.1 dB or whatever you need in your link budget. So two very different approaches here. One, quite favoring IP, favoring uh, commercial standards, which and indeed ISO standards. The other looking at uh, the CCSDS approach, again, ISO standards, but ISO standards that have been defined by CCSDS for space. These can be complementary, but quite often they seem to be in competition. Now, coming to Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, who I've done a lot of work with, uh, USAT-12, pictured there, launched in 1999, uh, uses AX25 for TT&C. Now, at the time, I was doing my PhD in the room next to the ground station, and I read the press releases and went, well, OK, it's AX25. It's got 9,600 bits per second, 38.4 kilobits per second. It's really slow. Because my background's kind of networking, and I'm just going, well, that's slow. That's not really interesting. And it's very big for something so slow. What are they doing? What I hadn't written, because the largest thing, it was the largest thing that SSTL had flown for quite a while. It's actually uh, three, kind of like three USATs bolted together. So you've got th three, three sets of racks in there, lots of equipment. But the point of USAT-12 is that it was a demonstration mission. It prototyped a lot of new technologies which were tested out over the next couple of years and weren't mentioned in that initial press release. It had SBAD and links on board. It had cameras. Um, it had new stabilization techniques. And those went into the disaster monitoring constellation that SSTL built. It even flew on board 10 megabit per second Ethernet, um, which SSTL evaluated, commented that the Ethernet chips uh, seem to be pretty power hungry and hasn't really pursued since. And from a networking point of view, what was interesting is that SSTL developed with Hoagie at NASA Goddard and others an IP stack that they uploaded to the satellite later so they could actually play with internet communications in space. Now, they weren't the first to do so. Uh, CCSDS had actually done its own um, kind of skips uh, IP-like experiments on the British Science and Technology Research Vehicle in 1996. But here we were playing with a web server in space, uh, doing, integrating with the internet, doing some fairly good stuff. And it basically showed that you could use uh, the internet protocol 
and that Hoagie's approach using commercial protocols was actually viable on spacecraft. Now, the, the internet has been extended to space bit by bit. I mentioned the, the British uh, STRV-1B satellite, which was given an IP address and where some pings were carried out, very simple and basic. So NASA had the uh, first uh, internet address in space, although it wasn't on a, a NASA spacecraft. Because remember, this is an experiment, and convincing NASA project managers to adopt it for operational missions is very, very difficult. So you do the experiments where you can, and quite often that won't be on the NASA-designed spacecraft. Then people around NASA Goddard worked to put an internet stack on USAT-12, which eventually led to the disaster monitoring constellation. Uh, again, they announced it to be the uh, first in space, and uh, again, it was a, a NASA project, but na not a NASA-built satellite. We've also got IP on board the shuttle and um, International Space Station. Wherever you have humans, you are going to need the full internet. Um, one way of thinking of a human is just as a bursty, unpredictable traffic generator. And, and you need the internet around to, curp, to cope with that demand for bursty, unpredictable traffic. The Russians flew a Cabletron uh, router on the, on the Russian module. They just went out and bought a commercial product and uh, changed the connectors, made them a bit more robust, and that flew into space quite nicely. A few years later, um, Hewlett Packard flew some pro-curve switches and made a, a big song and dance about having the first switches in space. Um, so first get claimed a lot. IP has been used in shuttle experiments. You've got the orbiting communications adapter so you can tunnel uh, the internet protocol across NASA's TDRS satellites. And um, you know, you've even tested uh, IP telephony from uh, the shuttle Atlantis. And Keith Hoagie and co had the communication navigation demonstration on board the shuttle, tested on board the last Columbia mission, which uh, burnt up uh, coming back down. Um, the astronauts there were, were simply responsible for turning on the payload and turning off the payload a week later. It was run completely from ground. They demonstrated seamless handovers with mobile IP and showed that internet technologies can do you know, quite a number of good things. Uh, SpaceDev built the cosmic hot interstellar plasma spectrometer satellite, uh, Chipsat. That was launched in January 2003, low Earth orbit. That actually uh, transferred all its data down to the ground using FTP and TCP. Didn't have much data to transfer. Uh, it wasn't able to find uh, what it was set out to, so a negative result there. But they did trump at the fact that they had the first TCP IP node in space. Uh, so again, a NASA mission. Again, not built by NASA, but again, demonstrating... Uh, that you could actually use IP in space nicely. And then SSTL adopted the internet protocol with the disaster monitoring constellation satellites. Initially with the Algerian contribution, LSAT-1, which was launched in November 2002, where the payloads were experimenting with this newfangled internet protocol stuff, but the platform was still good old reliable AX25 because you didn't want to take a risk with the mission. Later satellites launched. Gradually they became more comfortable with the IP piece and they said, okay, let's try doing IP for uh, TT and C as well, because then we can do things like relay on uh, the information quite easily across the internet. Although, if they require something with the maximum heritage, uh, for example, for the GEOV missions, they will quite happily use AX25, because it has the most robust flight heritage in space. Now, because Hoagie had done what he'd done with standard protocols um, that are commercially used, we were able to put an internet router on board the UK DMC satellite. So we were able to take a terrestrial internet router, do some simple modifications, put it on the satellite, fly it in space, and do more internet tests in space. And all of that is possible because of the work that Hoagie did on USAT-12. And Hoagie has worked on other missions since. So there's a, a gradual increasing use of his approach to space communications using IP, using HDLC. Now, you're, I presume you're all familiar with the disaster monitoring constellation, yes or no? Yes? Okay, so I can skip through this fairly quickly. You know that uh, the constellation exists. It started out as a government-owned thing. Each government would buy a ground station and contribute that to the overall network, kind of like what was described for Genso earlier. So you've got multiple ground stations around the world where you can download imagery. Uh, the satellites, the capacity on the satellites has been getting higher. The links have been getting faster. The cameras have been getting uh, better. So you get uh, better imagery over time. And currently, uh, the last two satellites that were built at the University of Surrey, the two Nigerian satellites, are currently being uh, 
ready, currently waiting for launch, as uh, Martin Sweeting mentioned earlier. DMC in use here. You can just see a shot of uh, New Orleans. Uh, red is vegetation, it's false color imagery. So you can compare the uh, unflooded areas with the flooded areas. Uh, what's interesting to me with this image is, of course, that it was downloaded using the internet protocol, but that the download happened from the Nigerian contribution to the disaster mon monitoring constellation. So the Nigerians were in a position to help the United States in their hour of need. Nigeria, not just spam technology. And in actual fact, this was actually done under the aegis of the United Nations, what we call the Disasters Charter. So the satellites are imaging and providing commercial capacity and you know, images can be sold, but if there's a disaster, they, they will actually use their capacity, provide imagery as quickly as possible, and the first responders on the ground can use that imagery usefully. And it's all delivered via the internet protocol, so internet communications is being used operationally in a mission-critical environment here. Now, I'm going to talk a bit more about the network environment for the disaster monitoring constellation. So each satellite is effectively a network of onboard computers that are all interconnected. You've got the um, OBC, which runs the platform, and it's called the OBC because way back when it was only the OBC. And you also have the payload computers, which run the imaging. And these are all interconnected together via serial links, uh, using 8 megabit per second serial links. There's also a kind of CAN bus, which has power control and allows you to control things. It's, it's kind of a backup. So this is, if you like, SSTL's heritage. They've always had CAN bus there. They, they leverage it quite nicely. Here, the serial links were a, a new thing to try. We were able to fit the Cisco router on board by just interfacing to those existing serial links. So use a serial card, interface with the links. That gave us access to the router to be able to do interesting things. On the ground, Keith Hoagie was instrumental in introducing an internet router into the ground station, connected to the modem. And funnily enough, on a Cisco router, the maximum speed on the serial interface is, wait for it, 8 megabits per second. So the downlink, the onboard links, everything dimensions around that router. Although they've gone to much faster speeds since and slightly different hardware. So the serial rates have become much faster over time. One of the things they need to do is download as much imagery as possible during a, say, 10 to 12 minute pass. No waiting around, no ping pong exchanges of packets or handshaking or setting it up, just stream data as quickly as possible. So the piece they developed for that, which I'll be talking a bit more about later, is a transport protocol uh, that they call Saratoga. And that is designed to download imagery as quickly as possible. Now, here's a quick shot of the internet router we flew on the UK DMC satellite. So it's in the left-hand part of the payload tray. The right-hand part is the battery control regulator for the satellite. At top, the orange is the heat sink on the processor. So no fans are useful in space. So you've got to conduct the heat away to the aluminum chassis. Below that, you have the serial card and all of the wires interfacing that. SSTL designed the motherboard, which is essentially power control and gives us access to the router's console port via CAN bus. Stick a lid on it, uh, run some massive bolts around a whole stack of these and bolt it up, and you've got the basis of the initial DMC satellite design. So we were able to use that router and do a number of uh, tests in orbit. We launched in September 2003. We demonstrated uh, the router to a, a military uh, thing at Vandenberg in June 2004 showed that you could actually communicate with a router, run it as a web server, run mobile IP and a bunch of other things just to show that it worked. A bit later than that, uh, we upgrade, I upgraded SSTL to uh, use IPv6 as well as IPv4 and we were able to demonstrate IPv6 and IPsec in orbit in 2007. The router worked after over five years in space. It would probably still work at the moment but the UK DMC is currently nearing the end of its life. It's been put in a slightly lower orbit, and they're conserving power, so we haven't played with it recently. We were also able to uh, work with the Japanese and have the Japanese done, do some similar internet tests as well, and they've done some similar demonstrations. Uh, can't actually read the papers, of course, because they're all in Japanese. And the success of this router has actually led to a further internet router on a geostationary satellite, uh, what they call the IRIS router. 
that launched a geostationary orbit in November 2009. So the idea of putting a router in space as a demonstration, this worked pretty nicely. And it also showed that Keith Hoagie's approach to networking would work well in the space environment. But we've also been able to take it a bit further. And now there's a router at geostationary orbit being tested to try and change the nature of the way that geostationary satellites do their communication. Now, coming back to the interplanetary internet that this talk is actually supposed to be about. So, while I was actually messing around with a router in space and learning about IP in space and things like that, the interplanetary internet was uh, developing as well. So, Vint was able to use the ISOC, the Internet Society that he set up uh, you know, for users of the internet, set up a special interest group looking at the interplanetary internet problem. Uh, I was secretary of that for a while. Uh, then there was a, a research group in the Internet Research Task Force, which is a sister body to the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they issued some initial internet drafts basically saying, okay, this is what the problem is. We need to look at long-distance communications and develop a new protocol that is very, very patient and does not time out just because it's waiting for a packet from Mars. Now, at that point, it kind of went off the rails slightly. So Kevin Fall here wrote a research paper to the uh, SIGCOM conference, which is well-respected in computer science circles, suggesting that this interplanetary internet protocol be used for what he termed delay-tolerant networking. Now, he was proposing that delay-tolerant networking could be the answer to mobile computing in general, and the... Um, existing ad hoc networking field in computing, which hadn't been much, had much success in terms of getting funding or anything like that, saw this as a, a, a new paradigm. And ad hoc networking became delay torrent networking and everyone piled onto this kind of new store and forward way of doing communications. As a result of that, uh, a delay torrent networking group was set up in the Internet Engineering Task Force and DARPA funding got involved as well. Uh, Vint was the DARPA program manager in the 70s, well connected. And as a result, things started to happen and the military said, we like this delay torrent networking thing, but our problem is really disruption torrent networking. We're just changing the D slightly. But surely it's the same thing, really. It's going to work pretty fine. So the problem scope widened somewhat. So f at first it was simply, let's solve the deep space problem. Let's get NASA to do more networking in space. And then it became delay torrent networking, and we will also deal with mobile ad hoc networks. And then the military got involved and said, well, actually, we have networks that are actively jammed, and it's a bit different from ad hoc, but it's pretty close to ad hoc, really, so it's pretty much the same thing. And, um, so, yeah, DTN, great. Now, that's good because it attracts interest, it attracts attention, it attracts funding. And it means that JPL can work with others to solve their problem. But the question is whether you're still being able to solve the original problem because you've moved the goalposts and you're now dealing with a much wider problem. So there's a question of you know, feature creep, engineering scope creep. Are you still going to solve the original problem successfully? So effectively, we now have two different problem spaces. So here's a graph of sort of the stability of a link and predictability versus propagation delay. So deep space is very much a scheduled environment. You know when your probe is going to go behind a planet. You can, you can predict it all in advance very nicely. You've got a very, very long propagation delay but it's a very predictable environment. The, the core internet, you know, that is a very low delay environment, but the internet stays up. BGP routers do not go down. If they go down, they have special failover techniques to handle it. The internet does not go down, so the internet is at that point. Meanwhile, ad hoc networking, unscheduled, disruption, uh, an unpredictable environment. And the approaches you take to communication at the physical level vary. When the propagation delay is huge, you're going to favor FEC massively, because ARQ is not useful to you. It just takes too long to be useful. Whereas in the ad hoc environment, you will rely on a mix of ARQ and FEC, depending on what the environment does. And the question I always get when I show this slide is, well, what if I'm over in the top left? You haven't got anything in the top left. And in the top left, you've got very long propagation delay, but you've got a very unpredictable channel. And if you're deployed uh, spacecraft is sitting in the top left with its incredibly long propagation delay, you need to improve the channel conditions so that you're over in the top right, so you understand the channel really, really well, and then you've only got the long delay to deal with. So these are two very different problem spaces, but delay torrent networking was trying to address them both, which is pretty tricky to do. Now, delay torrent networking is essentially store and forward networking. On the terrestrial internet, we're used to end-to-end -to -end communications. We use the routers, we go through the routers, 
we have a, a control loop all the way to the other end that comes back rapidly, and it's a pretty fast control loop. With delay torrent networking, ad hoc networking, you don't have that end-to-end -end connectivity. You transfer something to another node and say, well, this is where it's got to get to, and you know, I hope it actually gets there. And you may not actually find out if it does. It's very loosely coupled. You don't have the same kind of engineering. So as a result, the traditional TCP approach, which is very much end-to-end -end direct communications, get a rapid response back, and if you don't time out and fail, doesn't work here. You need to be much more patient. Now, the bundle protocol developed for delay torrent networking was originally intended to run in deep space. It was first tested on the Deep Impact mission, which is photographed there. And its approach was to basically do what the internet did to all other networks in the 1970s. The internet was successful because it layered over these networks. It ignored the properties of the networks and just sat on top of them, and eventually it became the de facto network standard. Here, the bundle protocol is going to layer over different internets. So it will use convergence layer adapters, be it TCP or LickLeader or something else, to run over the local environments. Those local layers understand how to get across the network. The bundle protocol just sits on top and is kind of a sort of parasitic payload that moves across. And the bundle protocol itself has a remarkably complicated structure. Uh, lots of emphasis on security in there, but uh, no end-to-end -end reliability checks. It's very easy to change something in the mutual packets and introduce an error without it being uh, referenced. And it's kind of a computer science project, really. If you're dealing with a low-end embedded system, you know, the complexity of the protocol and uh, the software might be off-putting. At least that's my experience. Other, other people's experience may, may vary. It's got a complicated numeric format that's actually an ASM1 derivative. So this is not a trivial protocol by any means. But it's trying to, there's an expression, boil the ocean, if you like. It's aimed at a very large number of problem spaces. It's trying to solve mobility. It's trying to solve communications, reliability, routing, a bunch of other things. So as a result, it's a pretty complicated protocol. Now, it's possible that the bundle protocol, because it layers over different internets, could keep the terrestrial internet and the CCSDS space links, because they've got their own standards, completely separate. But it could join them together. It, could, it can run over both. So at that point, it wouldn't matter if you're on the terrestrial internet or you were using the CCSDS links, because the bundle protocol would become a common lingua franca and allow these two different networks to interoperate. That's one way of looking at it. The bundle protocol, as I mentioned, has convergence layers. It runs over a very large number of different things. Um, but what's actually happened is that because computer scientists have TCP IP-based um, machines on their desks, which they use every day, they naturally gravitate to implementing things using TCP IP. I mean, it's widely available. So a lot of the bundle protocol stuff actually runs directly over the internet protocol uh, via a number of different convergence layers. Uh, via TCP and UDP, uh, LickLeader, we've done our own protocol with SSTL, Saratoga. Uh, the, the one major exception here, of course, is the CCSDS protocols, which were the original uh, development space, which was custom space links. Now, there are some direct convergence layers, not IP-based, and those, some have work been done, particularly Bluetooth and, in fact, AX25. But in general, because IP already runs over so many different environments, if you run over IP, you're pretty much done. So the IP story is pretty much compelling, really. So much of the Bundle Protocol implementations that have been released software-wise do run over IP. Now, coming back to our clear router, we were able to test the Bundle Protocol in space and experiment with this interplanetary internet by reusing the router testbed that we built for the clear router. So here you can see a picture of the testbed. You've got the Clio engineering model assembly on the right-hand side with, you can see the motherboard and you can see the uh, serial card. On the left-hand side, you've got an SSTL payload computer. So we switched from messing around with configuring the router and uploading configurations to the satellite to reprogramming the SSTL computer and then uploading the reprogrammed computer software. So we, we were able to reuse that testbed for software development. And we were able to take the SSTL transfer protocol, Saratoga, and put the bundle protocol over it and try it out for interplanetary internet tests. So Saratoga, which I mentioned a couple of times, is a very simple, very fast file transfer protocol. Simply run as fast as possible, run at line speed, transfer all the data you have as quickly as possible. 
Uh, SSTL developed this. Um, we redesigned it and took it to the Internet Engineering Task Force. Uh, it's currently specified. In fact, we presented on, on it uh, in the IETF meeting in Quebec yesterday. We've got multiple implementations. And we've tested those implementations. We've got interoperability, so that's pretty good. There's a picture of UK DMC satellite. Now, Saratoga is simply used to downlink data as quickly as possible. One of the constraints is that the uplink is very constrained, 9600 bits per second, uh, possibly 19.2 on a later mission. And we have to avoid congesting the uplink, otherwise um, communications stop. So Saratoga is very aware that it's an asymmetric environment. So you can be transferring um, hundreds of megabytes per second down, and the uh, latest planned uh, DMC missions will do 400 megabits per second at X-band. But the uplink is very, very constrained, and you send back the minimum signaling information. So that drove a lot of Saratoga's design. But downloading as much useful data as possible is the main thing. This is not TCP. We do not handshake. It does not wait around saying, can I now send another packet? It just streams at line rate. So we believe that the Internet Protocol is very useful for operational use in many networks because it's widely understood, it's widely implemented, it can be reused, and it's possible to reuse the DMC, sorry, reuse uh, the Internet Protocol in space as well. The Disaster Monitoring Constellation is an example of using IP both on the ground and in space and having them communicate together in what we call a merged uh, space ground architecture. Now, how IP is used in the ground and space differs. On the terrestrial internet, you're using TCP, you've got a shared network. But in the space environment, you're saying, OK, I'm going to use a different transport over IP. I'm going to download as quickly as possible, because that's what fits the model. But still, IP in both places. And what Saratoga does is just run at line speed. If there's an error, Saratoga says, well, OK, it's an error, I'll resend. It does not make TCP's assumption of assuming that an error is actually a lost packet, a congestion, and it must back off. It's very easy to make TCP do the behavior shown on the graph on the left, which is from a, a simulator, where TCP fills up to link capacity, congests itself, and goes, oh my goodness, there's a drop. This is a problem. I'd better back off because someone else might be trying to use the link, even when TCP is the only thing in the link. So TCP will quite happily oscillate all the time. And that oscillation loses you a bit of speed. Whereas with Saratoga, it goes, OK, there's an error. I have to rep repeat it. Um, but I'm still going to run at line rate. So you have slightly different behavior between the two. And that's what makes Saratoga useful for its environment. But on the terrestrial internet, you would need to implement what we call congestion control in Saratoga so that Saratoga will be safe to share with other flows. So Saratoga runs at speed. TCP doesn't. Um, Saratoga doesn't have uh, specified timers, whereas TCP does. So you could use a Saratoga all the way from Pluto, and it would work. And also, simplicity. Uh, code footprint size and a couple of other things are considerations as well. So, the so Saratoga effectively substitutes for an FTP application running over TCP with a smaller code footprint. The reason why it's called Saratoga is it was originally designed by Chris Jackson, principal engineer of SSTL. And he's actually dived in Bikini Atoll where the USS Saratoga, the battleship pit, uh, pictured here, therefore, sorry, the carrier pictured here, is that it was sunk after the atom bomb tests. So Saratoga can provide reliable transfers. It's got a built-in integrity check as well, whereas the bundle protocol designed by the DTM research group doesn't actually have those reliability checks. It ignores a, a famous networking principle called the end-to-end -end principle, and that has interesting ramifications for long-term reliability. So when we tested uh, the bundle protocol over Saratoga to do the interplanetary internet tests, we're actually able to verify the data using the, the Saratoga checksums and make sure it got across uh, successfully. So I mentioned bundle protocol tests in space. We were first by a few months. Um, on the UK DMC satellite, we took the bundle protocol, put it over SSTL's operational Saratoga by modifying Saratoga to support the bundle protocol, and did some downloads and demonstrates interoperability with uh, other DTN implementations. Meanwhile, NASA JPL had been working to upload the bundle protocol to the Deep Impact Comet Probe, which was uh, currently had completed its mission. Uh, that was renamed the Deep Impact uh, DTN Experiment, or, or DINET. Um, and they took the, the a slightly different approach in what they actually did with that to demonstrate that they worked. And, and these both happened in October 
and September 2008. So we'd had some earlier experiments which failed due to problems with the bundle protocol that we debugged. Um, so it turned out to be a pretty close run thing. So we downloaded a, a remote sensing image with using the bundle protocol. So this is the first results of the first interplanetary internet test. 150 megabyte image of Cape of the Cape Province. You can see uh, Cape Town over on the right, Cape Good Hope. And we, we did that demonstrating fragmentation, which is one of the things Bundle Protocol supports in August. And uh, we made the cover of Time magazine almost. Um, so I was really busy with these tests at the time, but apparently there was something going on, something involving these two guys. Not entirely sure what, wasn't paying much attention. Uh, and just a bit afterwards, uh, NASA JPL was able to experiment with using uh, the Comet probe as um, a, a relay, if you like. So they uploaded very small images to the comet and downloaded it again. So we had the luxury of pretty high rates and a pretty small distance. They were much further away, uh, 80 seconds and then down to 50 seconds. And they were much more constrained in what they could upload. So for example, what, one of the things they uploaded was a picture of JCR Licklider, who is famous for a, a number of, uh, if you like, galactic network memos he wrote that were very thought provoking in the 1960s. And the Licklider protocol that transports the bundle protocol is named after him. So they were using the Comet probe as a relay and getting stuff back for it. They weren't actually allowed, unfortunately, to mess with the operational side of the spacecraft and actually access imagery. Um, so there's limits to what you can do on a NASA operational mission, and that's why so, so much of NASA does experiments outside the NASA operational min mission. The networking stacks used in these experiments were slightly different. So ours is pretty straightforward. Um, so we're using the internet protocol. So of the TCP ICP suite, we're not using TCP. TCP is not implemented on board the satellite. We're using its sister protocol, which doesn't get as much publicity, the user datagram protocol, UDP, running Saratoga over that on the payload, and then running the bundle protocol over that. Meanwhile, the um, deep impact probe, they've got a much more complicated stack. They're running CCSDS. They've got link service adapters in there. And in fact, the link service adapter they've got is the existing uh, CCSDS file delivery protocol, which is effectively a precursor to the bundle protocol. So they had to demonstrate the bundle protocol on LTP by running over something that already had pretty similar functionality. So much more constrained environment, much more complex environment, but they're a deep space probe. You know, it's a difficult place to be. Interesting difference in philosophies in terms of imagery. Uh, their deep space, fairly low rates. Their bundle approach is to send small bundles, 64K limit, and almost treat the bundles as packets. If you've got larger than that, you send multiple bundles and reassemble. Whereas we're saying, well, the bundle, it can be up to, say, 4 gig, and we will just transfer it as effectively a very large file and let the packetization of UDP IP take care of it. So very different engineering approaches. Our experiments allowed us to discover some problems with bundling. I've mentioned reliability earlier. Um, if you don't implement the optional bundle security suite, you have absolutely no error detection at all. Um, and if you do implement the suite, you think, the area, you think anything that crops up is, a, is an attack. Um, so there are problems with the end-to-end -end principle there. Another problem is a matter of timing. So way back when, we said, well, OK, you know, every spacecraft needs to have a clock because it's got to know what it's doing when. And even if this clock drifts in space, um, you can reset the clock to the right time, synchronize with the ground, so that's not really a problem. But bundles were set up with expiry times. And what that means is if a bundle arrives and the clock it's been sent from is misset and the bundle arrives that's in the past, the bundle agent just drops it instantly. It goes, well, sorry, that's already expired. I'm not going to spend time with that. So if you have misset clocks, and we actually found this by shipping computers around to build our DTN network, when they arrived, they couldn't actually communicate until we synced the clocks because there was a three-second timeout involved. So more than that was a bit of a problem. Uh, and it also means that you can't actually, if you, if you know you don't know the time, you can't use the bundle protocol to find out the time, because if you're in the past, the, any bundles you send will be expired. So this was a, a sticking point in the research group, and the computer scientists were pretty much insisting that um, you know, clocks were commonplace, clocks were on everything, you know, time is a solved problem. Right. Um, but in actual fact, timing is a really difficult problem. You know, spacecraft have uh, clocks, but a lot of military systems, you, know, you save battery power, you power them down completely. You know, so this has been a, a barrier to adopting the bundle protocol widely. A um, bunch of other problems as well. Um, in some respects, it's a computer science project. You don't have, for example, MIME for applications or other things. 
Um, so, so we raised a bunch of questions about the bundle protocol and how it could be used. Uh, quite complex. So effectively, you've got two parallel uh, paths here. The NASA Goddard HDLC world, which started in the 90s. The CCSDS world, which started earlier than that. Um, and they haven't really joined together yet. CFTP and DTN can bridge the internet and um, the CCSDS world. Whether it turns out like that, not entirely sure. So some related thoughts on this is that use of standards in space are a good thing. But the question is whether space really has to have its own completely separate standards. CCSDS says yes, says we understand the space environment, we can optimize for it. But at the same time, it's been promoting the bundle protocol for other environments, which hasn't proven too successful. Um, CCSDS is reluctant to deal with HDLC, but HDLC gives us layering separation and engineering reuse, which has worked out very well in low Earth orbit, perhaps not as well in the optimized environment of deep space. And there's a question as to whether the bundle protocol is a failure for not meeting the needs of its various problem spaces, whether it's just been expected to do too much. I also have a question over interplanetary internet and whether the idea of eventually getting these end-of-life probes to communicate and build a network is possible. So I spent a lot of time working on intersatellite links, which have been proven pretty nicely in Iridium, where they were designed in originally. But for a lot of satellites, they said, well, we could fly an intersatellite link, but it's not core to what we're doing. It just adds mass. It doesn't do anything. It's a distraction. We're not going to do it. And space probes, their project managers may have the same concern and say, well, we're doing this. This is all we're doing. We want to be successful at that. We're not going to consider the bundle protocol or networking with other devices and building an interplanetary internet because that's not what we're here for. So the interplanetary internet could have a pretty hard sell. Now, we've also found new uses of Saratoga, and this is pretty much where I wrap up, because effectively, we've been using the satellite. It's doing sensor imagery. We wanted to produce a protocol that could handle any size file, because SSTL's images grew to the point where they crossed the 4 gig boundary, at which point you need more than 32 bits. So we produced a scalable file transfer protocol that could handle even bigger files or smaller files. So we even implemented uh, support for 128-bit pointers, which would allow you to do 256 exa exabyte files. Now, nobody's doing files that big yet. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, 20 years ago, did you think you were going to be holding gigabytes in your pocket on your MP3 player? So it's very possible we could get those sizes. So the implementations do 32, 64 bits, which gets you up to 16 exabytes. 128 bits is not needed yet. And this introduced us to a new user. Radio astronomers produce massive amounts of data in terrestrial networks. They're not in space looking at the ground. They're in the ground looking up at space. So we've gone from on satellite. NASA Glenn is exploring sensors on unmanned aerial vehicles. And CSIRO in Australia is looking at building the world's largest uh, astronomy network, the Square Kilometre Array, which is expected to span the entire either Australian or African continents, depending on which bid gets built. Lots of optical fiber, lots of very high speed links where you want to run at absolute link capacity. And the Saratoga protocol developed here in Guildford can do that. So we're currently exploring that. And we've got interoperability between uh, these three players and implementations of Saratoga. So in the square kilometer array, you're actually using Saratoga in two ways, in delivering real-time sensor data from the sensors to the beamformers. And once you've actually processed the data cube in a supercomputing correlator, you actually deliver it onwards rapidly as files rather than as streams using Saratoga. So this looks uh, pretty interesting, and it's a pretty nice kind of technology spin-off. So Saratoga is really aimed at a very small problem, unlike the bundle protocol, which is a very large problem space. Private sensor networks, you're reusing internet technology because it's cheap, reliable, and robust, but you're running as fast as possible. You've engineered the network for a specific problem. Um, we started out on satellites. Now we're going to radio astronomy. So to wrap up my talk, some brief conclusions. The internet and the interplanetary internet aren't quite the same thing, although we've done both together. The terrestrial internet, you've got the full TCP IP suite, you've got DNS, you've got routing, a bunch of other things. Internet in space for the SSTL uh, disaster monitoring, monitoring constellation is a cut down version of that. Uh, you've got static routing, uh, you're not using TCP, you're using UDP and you're running something over that for speed. Whereas the interplanetary internet is based around the bundle protocol and originally intended to be over CCSDS. So we've tested the internet in space, We've shown that the, uh, we're quite happy that Hoagie's approach with HDLC and IP works very nicely. And we were able to leverage that technology, uh, which turned out to be fairly straightforward, and run the interplanetary internet over it too. And as a result, we've come up with some interesting bits of technology, and it's going to be interesting to see where they're used in the future. That's pretty much my talk. Any more information? Loads of papers online. 
And, oh my goodness, I can't even spell thank you. Stuff there. It seems a long time since uh, uh, Jeff Ward. It's, it's quite a long time since Jeff Ward invented uh, F uh, FTL zero. Thanks, which was uh, what I remember quite well. I think with someone in the states was it uh, Jim White, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and that was all back in the CompuServe days. But uh, it's nice to see that things are going mm. on. At Still. Yes, I, th I think there's a, a direct line that you can draw from Jeff Ward's stuff uh, through some other SSTL protocols. At one point they had a protocol called NUP, the New Upload Protocol, um, which is kind of a precursor of Saratoga. Never call a protocol new, especially when you wind up using it for decades. <laughs> okay. um, so any questions for, for Lloyd? Go. Just wait for the microphone. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Hi, Lloyd. Um, I was just thinking, you, nowadays we have these ground-based internet terminals and they send their signals up to the satellite back and forwards. What sort of protocol do they use for a TCIP? Because it's TCIP at the end where the user is. Okay, so you're talking about two-way satellite communications through a geostationary satellite. Um, and they do, in fact, use all the standard internet protocols. So TCP was designed to work through geostationary satellites. It does so, but not particularly well. Um, you've got 250 milliseconds delay, 125 milliseconds to satellite, and 125 milliseconds back, or even more, depending on what the access pro protocol used is. Um, the performance is generally considered low, so you have TCP accelerators, which just lie about what the protocol is doing, and are implemented at both ends, so that you can get a bit more performance out of TCP. If you're running encryption in your network, then the performance-enhancing proxies can't even see the TCP headers and do their magic. So as a result, performance is even less than that. So TCP works over satellite, but the contention ratio of shared satellites and the access mechanisms slow up access even further. Uh, using encryption and preventing a TCP performance-enhancing proxy from doing its stuff can slow things up even further as well. So if, if all you've got is, if you're in the middle of nowhere and all you've got is satellite communication, uh, you can run the internet over it and you will learn to live with it, but uh, satellite will not be an alternative to, say, a broadband cable network. Thank you. Any other questions? Any from the internet? Okay, I don't see anyone nodding or down. Okay. Well, they're on the internet. They know all this stuff already. <laughs> <laughs> they're all probably, probably still at the reference. Uh, Lloyd, thanks very much indeed. Thank